just trying to get myself organized with the orientation again this morning. It's giving me some trouble. And when I do get myself organized, we are going to do a little bit of watercolor uh, tutorial stuff today. Uh, we've been having some conversations with one of the fantasy map making groups that I'm part of on Facebook. And sorry, you can probably hear Saxon moving around under my desk. Hopefully he just mellows out here right away. Um, so we're doing some watercolor tutorials for one of my fantasy map making groups. We've been talking lately about um, different media that we all like using when we're working. And I've been on quite a kick with watercolors lately. So I thought I would give a little bit of a rundown of what I know. Um, I am by no means an expert, I'm completely self-taught, so everything that I've learned, I've learned from reading on books and online. Um, so if you have better information, totally pass it on. <laughs> I am always open to learning more things and having me self-corrected if uh, that's a thing that needs to happen. So yeah, I um, think we'll just kind of start with a general kind of rundown here. Uh, first thing I'm going to talk about is supplies. So I have a couple of different kinds of things that I work with on the regular basis. Um, the most common thing for people who are doing watercolors that's probably the most familiar uh, are things like watercolor pans. So you got something like that or most of us are familiar kind of with more something like this where there are larger pans. Maybe you had a set like this as kids that came with coloring books and that black bristled plastic brush. Um, this is a super portable way to take watercolor with you wherever you're going. Uh, this one that I have right here is a student set by Lucas and it's actually specifically designed to be portable. It's quite small. It fits in a pencil case. It lives in my backpack 100% of the time. It's got this great loop on the back so I can have it on my hand um, if I'm painting out in the open. So I can mix on my sides here. Uh, and then when I'm done, I can just pack it up. I live with this in my bag because I find that I do a lot more painting uh, on location, when I'm bored, in waiting rooms, whatever, just simply because I have it available to me all of the time. Um, it works really well with water brushes, which I will show you in a minute. The other version of pans that I use are these ones. This particular set is a German set that was given to me by my grandfather quite some time ago. They are student grade, as in like elementary student grade. So they have a lot of pigment. The color is actually fairly harsh uh, compared to more of the subtleties of these uh, or a professional grade pan. This is a, an art student grade pan. So it cost me about $50 Canadian. Um, the colors are completely adequate for my purposes. As I work through some of them, I'm probably going to replace them with professional grade ones, just have a better clarity of color, a um, little bit more refinement. But these ones completely do everything I need them to do right now. These ones are not as good, um, but I do love the variety of color that's available. I'm in particularly in love with this, partic this teal over here. The range of blues in here is really nice. I love that there's an ochre. Um, I've started to realize that I completely underestimated how useful ochre was. And what's interesting for me about this set is that there's actually a black. Um, and I'll get into why that's a little bit more interesting and of note later on when I'm talking about color mixing. So yeah, this is, I guess, what was the last thing I wanted to say? Oh, uh, full pan, half pan. So this one here is, these are called half pans. These are a smaller size. Um, they will still probably last you forever. A half pan is about that thick, so you still have a lot of depth in terms of this pigment. It's about that wide. There's a lot of paint in here. Um, I like half pans for traveling because you can get a lot more colors worked into a setup like this. Uh, full pans are about twice that size. Um, they last, of course, twice as long. And it just kind of depends on if you love a color that much or you have the room to take it with you. I was going for sheer ease of movement with this. Um, but for something like this where I know I'm staying at home and I'm not throwing it in my backpack all the time, having the larger pans is just great. I have no objections to that at all. The biggest drawback to a half pan is if you're using a large brush trying to do washes or something like that, it takes a lot more work to load your brush up. 
and get you what you need to make that wash really smooth and fluid. When you're dealing with a larger pan size, you can get that on your brush with way less effort, um, more even application. It gives you the ability to lay things down more smoothly. Uh, it's not my preference to do large scale washes with pans. I prefer to use liquids, which we'll go into next, I think. So yeah, this is, this is the one that lives in the bag and goes everywhere. <laughs> Uh, this is the one that stays at home on my desk for when I'm looking for super specific colors. Or maybe I'm just de testing out an idea that I want to have a bit more fun with. It doesn't need to be super high grade at the end. Uh, get this out of the way. Here we go. Alright, so tubes was the next thing I wanted to talk about. So this is probably the second most common form of watercolor that people are familiar with. Um, tubes are great because they last for a really long time. Like as long as your metal body doesn't get compromised, um, this particular tube of paint is probably 15 years old. I bought it at a hardware store when I was a kid uh, and it's still good to go. Like I can open this, although it may have got itself stuck shut and my hands are not that strong. Um, I can open it and I can squeeze them out and we'll be ready to play. Like that's not gonna be an issue. If the metal gets compromised or maybe it didn't get closed properly, I don't know if you can see the threading on here, but you can see the threading and that's the problem. Um, you might be able to get it open, but this is dry. See how I can't get anything out of there no matter how much I squish? This has been compromised. The great thing about watercolor is if you can peel this open, you can just add more water and it's gonna work because basically what's happened inside of this tube is what has turned it into the hard pan that, um, is going on in my in my carrying case that I take everywhere. So if you can open it up again, and <laughs> it's worth it to you to do that, you can have access to this paint and it's still perfectly usable. Um, so the great thing about tube watercolors is you get a lot of them, like a tube, like I've said, I've had some of these for 15 years, they last forever. Um, you can get a lot of colors because they're not typically very expensive, so you can buy a tube or two at a time and really build up the range that you have. Um, there's lots of different brands for them, so you can kind of go through and start deciding if you want like student grade watercolor or if you want um, professional grade watercolor. The biggest difference for that is going to be price. So let's maybe give you an example of this. This is the titanium white. Um, that is a low-end professional grade and this tube cost me $11.81. Whites are always going to be a little bit more expensive just because of what goes into making them. Um, but this is a range, right? This Grumbacher was $4.09 15 years ago, so it's probably gone up since then. Um, but it's a much lower quality. We just, we know that by the brand name. As you start to get into this, you'll start to learn kind of what brands you're really into, what brands you're not. Uh, Windsor & Newton is very reliable. I like their stuff quite a bit. Um, you get what you pay for with them, for sure. This one is a professional grade um, Van Dyke Brown, and I think it cost me $12 for a half tube. However, this tube is still going to last me forever. So you gotta get to play around with what you want, um, build up your color collection as you go. The great thing about tube colors is you can mix them. Um, where you have to mix on a palette when you're dealing with a, um, a half pan or a full pan, you have to kind of blend in a different space. With these, you can actually squeeze some out and mix them on a separate palette until you get a color that you want. And you can do it in sufficient quantity to have that color to come back to later. So there are artists that I know who get empty pans. Um, so you can get them on Amazon or in art stores. You can get empty ones of these. And you can go on to a separate palette. I recommend ceramic or plastic. And you can take a palette brush. You can mix whatever color you want. Once you have that color in quantity, you can scrape it into one of these pans and just let it dry. And once it's done drying, you have that custom color for your own use until it runs out. You can start keeping a journal of what kinds of colors you want to have. So if there's a custom teal that you absolutely love for water, you can write down that I used, you know, a half a gram of phyllo blue and half a gram of sap green and this was the ratio and then you can mix it up in the future and that's no problem um, you can even do it by drops if you're using liquid colors I find that the easiest just because dropping is a li little bit more precise than having to measure like by a gram on a kitchen scale or something like that 
but you can create custom colors. You can write down the formula for them. You can keep going back to them. And that is probably the single most useful part of dealing with a tube. It just gives you a lot more latitude for that. Okay, I think that's tubes. Um, do -do -do -do. This little pink toolbox is pink and glittery and kind of obnoxious, but I love it. I used to carry lip glosses back in the 90s when Lip Smackers was a big deal. And it turns out it's been perfect for carrying tube watercolors ever since. Also in tubes is a product called gouache, gauche, not gauche. I can never pronounce it. Uh, it is spelled G-O-U-C-H-E. These are opaque watercolors. And the reason that that is significant is that for most watercolors, what you want is translucency. And the reason for that is you want the white of the paper to show through your paint because that's what gives watercolor painting its vibrancy. With gouache, you're dealing with something that blocks out that white. Um, where this becomes really, really useful is if you are wanting that flat, more acrylic expression of color. Um, you don't want to deal with variation in that particular section or what have you. Um, it's really great for adding white highlights because it goes over what is ever underneath it and just whites it out essentially. And that can be really useful if an area gets overworked or if an area is just you need that white sparkle on maybe a black piece of armor or a crystal or something like that. Um, so I don't use these as much, but there are artists that have absolutely thrived with them. One of my favorite artists is um, a painter from the 70s and 80s named Rodney Matthews. He does absolutely brilliant fantasy work. Uh, did a lot of like rock album covers and stuff like that. Uh, he worked a lot in gouache and his stuff is amazing. You can dilute it down with a brush and water to give you a different kind of um, effect, but it will always be more heavily pigmented than a traditional paint. So let's just do a quick, quick demonstration. So you see how that's really thick and like you can see the paper behind it in terms of the paper being bright, but it's not translucent. So when you add water, you will get more translucence, but it will not be as trans translucent without a lot of water as what you would get with a straight up watercolor. And so exactly like working with the watercolor, the more dilution you give it, the paler your color is going to get, the more clear it's going to get, the more you're going to be able to see whatever is under it. So you can kind of see the transition here from a super thick paint to something that's a lot thinner. The cool thing about this is you can go back in, we'll get into this a little bit more, and you can just layer it over and see what you come up with. So yeah, I don't use these as often. They definitely have their place. Uh, they tend to be really affordable. I think this entire set, oh, I left the tag on it. So this entire set of 12, uh, which is Faber-Castell, they're student grade, they are definitely worth investing, was $13 at my local art store. And they will last, again, for an incredibly long time because you're dealing with a very large size tube. So that is that one. I'm um, going to move on to my favorites now. Um, I have recently have absolutely fallen in love with liquid watercolors. Um, I'd never worked with them prior to the last little while, and they are magnificent, and I am a huge fan. Um, my favorite brand currently is the Dr. Martin um, watercolors. There are a few that I've played with, but this is the brand that is the most available at my local art store, um, and it comes in a bunch of different varieties, so I'll go over those really quick here. Um, so far, my favorite are the Synchromatic transparent watercolors, and the reason that I'm really in love with them is, especially with browns, um, when you're dealing with pans, they can always they can be a little bit cloudy depending on what kind of pigment is going into them, and so you won't get that sheer amount of translucence coming through the page. It'll behave more like a gouache than like what I think of as a true watercolor. I'm probably using that word wrong, but this is what I've taught myself. So what I love about these is there's no cloud in them at all. These are completely translucent no matter what you do with them and they are punchy. So what I mean by that is it doesn't take much to have a really huge impact. So that's 
one drop. It looks pretty black, I'm sure, to you on the camera. Get my brush wet, add a little bit, and you have a gorgeous, well-mixed, perfectly flat wash that is really, really, really nice and solid. And this becomes a big deal when you're trying to lay down large areas of one color. So say you're doing a background wash, you're detailing the water on your map, you're detailing the land, what have you. And then you can always take it up and add more into that wash and bump it like that. Wet into wet is probably my absolute favorite thing to do with a watercolor. It's just fabulous. So I'm in love with these. The biggest thing about the synchromatic is that when you're using them, if you're doing wet into wet and you're letting expand over a big area, it can actually, certain colors can start separating. And this may or may not be something that you love. Um, I'm gonna give you an example of one that I really like that turned out well. So this is a map that I was working on recently just to test out some of the new colors that I've got. So there was no real plan going into this. It was just monkeying around. Do you see in here how it's kind of a darker ochre and then like right where these little tick lines are, it goes to a bright yellow? That is a separation of the actual ochre color bleeding out from what is the solid stable kind of the paint into just the white clear water that I had laying down there. I happen to love how this looks. I think it gives me a really interesting natural variation that does imply an elevation change. And that can be tricky to do on a map, so I love that it's kind of a shorthand for that. I also just love that it adds a particular kind of vibrancy. Um, yellow is really good for drawing the eye. It makes things feel really alive and very electric. And I like how that worked out when I'm dealing with land. Land can be kind of boring to paint sometimes, depending on what's going on, because we have a really restricted palette for that. And that makes sense, because then we all know what we're looking at. But sometimes it's just a little tedious. So what else is going on on this paper that I can talk about? So the yellow, like the ochre, and then this edge of the brown were both done with the synchromatic paints that are down here. The layers of green that got washed over in here, that took up the plants, the trees that I have here, and then a little bit of the grass on these edges, those were from the black full pans that I showed you earlier, the like child grade. And you can tell that they're cloudier. You can also tell that they're layered over an existing color because you have that existing color bleeding through. And just how it kind of has everything a little bit darker here, you can tell that there's more pigment just laying down on it in terms of the particulate in the paint. It's not reflecting light the same with the same kind of clarity as what we have going with the liquid watercolors that are up here. So they have their time and their place. And the more you play with them, the more you'll see kind of what your preferences are and how they work for you. The water on this is a, another liquid watercolor that's from a different brand. This is the Ecoline. I'm kind of in love with this blue just because it's really bold. Um, it's very electric. It's a, it's a very hot blue. Um, and I love how when you go wet into wet with it, it gives you like these intense areas and then it gives you these beautiful bleed outs. And I really love the randomness of that. So yeah, liquid watercolor, my new favorite thing. Perhaps I sound overly enthusiastic about it, I don't know. Uh, I can give you a couple different examples of what I was doing with this. So this one was entirely done with the black pan that I showed you earlier, the elementary grade. And you can see how it's more choppy in the water in terms of brush strokes and where my layers are interacting with each other. This is in part because I didn't spend as much time creating a perfectly smooth uh, background to work on, but it's also because the amount of liquid I could load up on my brush using a pan is not as much without it really shifting from laying down heavy density pigment in one area versus a lighter density. Like with the fluid, you just get a more consistent product over a wider space. This has its its time and its place too. Like the variation in here is a lot of fun. Oops, that wasn't intentional, it's okay. Um, but it's not necessarily as polished as what you would get with a liquid watercolor over a longer space. And the colors here are more cloudy. So this is the ochre that comes out of those black pans. And just compare that to the ochre that's going on on here. Some of it's tonally different, but if you look at the textures really up close, 
you can see that this has got a cloudier texture overall and that this is really, really clear. This is on the exact same paper. So it's important if you're making comparisons for products to be doing it on the same paper because that gives you a much better apples to apples comparison. So this is another one that's that blue uh, Econoline water. I love the variation that we got in here because it implies more depth. And when you're doing uh, maps, one of the things that I love is showing that there's the same kind of topographic awareness in your underwater areas as there is on land. There are absolutely trenches and mountains and hills and ranges and flat plains in the ocean as much as there is uh, in the land that we visibly see. So important for me to try and allude to that even if I'm not going to do it in as much detail as I could. Uh, this is the ochre um, and one of the darker browns. This entire range of color has been achieved by using two paints and a bunch of water. So depending on how you thin it out and how you lay it down, you can get an incredible tonal variety in terms of your chroma, which is awesome. Uh, the greens again are coming out of the elementary grade student palette, mostly because I wanted something that was going to give me a bit more coverage because I just laid down the ochre wash on the background. So when I tinted it green, I needed to try and cover that ochre a little bit. All right, I think that covers what I wanted to talk about for paint. So moving from paint, if you're gonna get into this, the next most prevalent thing you probably need to know about is paper. <laughs> because now that you have something to paint with, you're gonna want something to paint on. So I have a couple thoughts on that. This piece of paper that I have laying down right here is a Bristol vellum. It is currently my favorite drawing paper. It is what I am doing all of my ink maps on. Um, it is not the best for working with wet media because it's not designed for it. I don't know if you can tell, but it's buckling a little bit already. You can kind of see it better on the back, how there's divots here, that darkness. Um, it's not built to handle a lot of water. Um, that's not really a problem if you're doing like super light washes or if you're using a product like a Copic marker, which is wet, but it behaves differently on a surface like this. It can be more of a problem if you want to do wide washes of gouache or wide washes of watercolor because it will start to buckle. You can get around this um, by taping down your board. Um, so if I was working with this and I really wanted to use a very wet media on it, I would take this with painter's tape and I would attach it down to whatever smooth flat surface I'm working on. I would wash the whole thing with a wash of clear clean water and then I would let it completely dry. And that's called sizing and what it does is it kind of teaches the fiber of your paper to accept a heavier wash. It takes time because you need to let it completely dry before you can go back into it even if you want to do a wet on wet wash. Um, but it will help. If you can afford a thinner paper and that's all you've got to start working on, it is way better to start with what you can afford and work on it than it is to put off until you can afford whatever you think is going to do it for you. There's a lot of times when people hold out for more expensive materials and it just prevents them from starting. Um, as someone who is self-taught, I didn't have expensive materials until fairly recently. Like I've drawn and painted my entire life, but I did it with ballpoint pens and lined notebook paper because that's what I had access to. When I started painting, it was with hardware store tube paints and notebook paper because that's what I had access to. Um, the great thing about working with cheaper materials is that if you put enough time into it, you will still create quality work. And by the time you can move into more expensive materials, your technique is going to be so good that the expensive materials will just make your life easier. They're going to give you a better result, sure, but your technique is already going to be so good that you will see, uh, for me anyway, I saw a light year like, advancement in what I was capable of doing because my technique was already solid um, from working with less well-adapted materials. You grow to know your materials so much better when you start out working with cheap stuff. You learn their limitations, you learn where they excel, you learn how to kind of get around them um, in ways that I think there are sometimes people who start with the better materials don't necessarily put themselves through their paces as much as they could. So that's my praise of the cheap material and just making do with it. Anyway, paper. This is what we we're going to talk about. So this is a Bristol vellum. This is more of a drawing paper. You're going to find it in an area where you're dealing with pens, uh, markers, things like that. Not necessarily wet color. 
when you want to deal with wet color, uh, there's a few things to keep in mind. There's three kinds of paper that are ideally made for watercolors. The highest quality and most expensive one to have is going to be a handmade paper. Trust me, you will know if it's handmade. They will mark it all over the place to tell you that it is because that is a selling point. Um, particularly professional grade handmade paper, these are the ones that for an 18 by 20 sheet could run you anywhere between 15 and $20. Like you will know. Um, I don't advise using those right off the bat because it makes them precious and then you get afraid of messing up. And I know that's a huge issue for me. I don't like feeling like I'm wasting my money um, when I'm trying to work on something. And really expensive supplies are intimidating. I'm not a fan. <laughs> it puts me off making art at all. And that's not my goal. My goal is to make stuff as often as I can make stuff because the only time that I'm improving is when I'm actually working on my craft. I can think about it a lot, but visualizing does not actually make me better when it comes to working on my art project. So handmade paper is totally fantastic if you can afford it, if it doesn't freak you out. Um, I suggest trying it at least once so that you have an idea of what it works like. Um, and different brands are going to give you different effects. So I guess more than once is great if you can afford it. If you can't, don't stress yourself out about it. You can totally get absolutely fantastic results with a mold made paper, which is just about as good. Uh, it's just made differently. Um, the only one that I would really pay attention to are machine made papers because, and they're usually marketed as student grade. They are great for drafting. You can do some really decent work on them, but again, you'll need to really learn the limits of your materials to do that. Um, they're just the most likely to distort and to degrade under heavy wash. Like they're not usually 100% cotton. Usually there's some wood pulp in there or some um, other kinds of cellulose. Uh, they're a blended paper more often than not. And they just don't stand up as well to heavy wash. So you're going to get buckling. You're going to get paper actually like turning into pulp fiber and kind of lifting away from your project, which is not cool because it changes the surface of your paper. It can create irregularities in your wash. Um, it can just pull up a section of color that you were really excited about working with that all of a sudden isn't there. Um, but yeah, it, you can do some great stuff on them. I like it for drafting. If I'm working on a map and I'm not really sure the total direction of where I want it to go, I'll go through like a ream of student paper and work that out. Sorry guys, Saxon is trying to give me his rope. Buddy, I'm busy. I can't play with you right now. You're going to have to wait. You're really cute. I promise. So yeah, with paper, uh, you want to try and get 100% cotton if you can. If you can't afford it, the highest percentage of cotton that you can afford is great. It just behaves differently. Uh, it's going to give you a better result. So in terms of paper, there are lighter papers and there are heavier papers. A light paper is something that is considered less than 140 pounds or 300 GSM. Those measurements have to do with how much weight was placed on the fiber while it was being pressed into paper. I do not know about that science. Um, there are probably articles online. I'll see if I can find one uh, to post down there as to why it's marked out that way. All I know is that it works well for me. Um, and it's generally like the best for beginners. It's lightweight. It's easy to work with. It tends to be less expensive. Um, the ideal weight for beginners is probably 140 pounds, uh, 300 GSM. It takes a really good wash. You typically don't need to tape it down to work with it. It's heavy enough that it's going to hold its shape and not buckle too badly on you. Um, and that lets you kind of push the, the limits of what it can do. And it can also take ink and stuff really, really well, which is nice. Um, it's you, typically a smooth enough finish that you're not going to have trouble with like nibs catching on your paper. Uh, heavy papers are anywhere from 300 to 400 pounds, which is 600 to 850 GSM. They tend to be more expensive, but the plus of them is that they're nice and stiff and thick to work with, and they typically don't need to be stretched at all, um, which is great because you can just kind of get in and get going. They're really nice if you're a bit more on the impulsive side of things, um, which is sometimes a thing for me. Um, or if you just are looking for a stiffer experience to paint on because like a lighter paper, I've got one of these here, it bends pretty easily. A thicker paper is going to be stiffer. It's going to be more like a cardstock. And sometimes that's just really satisfying to work on. 
Um, in terms of paper, hot press is really smooth. So this Bristol Vellum is a hot press paper. It feels just nice and easy under your fingers. There's no pen nib that's gonna catch on it. There's gonna be no pooling on the page. Um, so even in this wash that we did up here, there's it's nice and smooth and flat. The variation that you're seeing is where the pigment in the gouache is laying down, not where it's tripping up on the paper itself. Uh, you can actually see that really, really clearly with this droplet that's right here, which is still wet. Um, when you're dealing with a heavier paper, you're going to get variation uh, just where the tooth of the paper is. So you can kind of see this rippling texture that's going on in here. That is from the cold press finish of this paper. Cold press just gives you um, a more toothy aspect to things. There's usually a pattern in it depending on how it gets put down. Uh, it's usually a very consistent pattern, so you're not going to have variations in the paper unless you buy something that is handmade and deliberately ragged, um, which will give you really fun painting experience, although it's a lot less predictable. Uh, I find that cold pressed paper uh, is better just because it has a bit more personality, um, and I enjoy that when I'm painting. I like to be surprised. I'm not someone who really loves having every single aspect of a painting worked out before I even put the pen down. Let's focus. Hey, come over here. Camera. What are you doing? Following. Hey, there we go. The marvels of technology, you guys. So, as I was talking before about like taping down to size and stuff, one of the solutions that you can do is something like an easy block for watercolor paper. What this is, is a brick of pages of that style of paper that have been glued down on two edges. So there's a plastic line here that's holding it down and there's a plastic line here that's holding it down. And that basically functions as the tape. Um, so you can do your painting on here. If it does buckle at all, if you're doing a heavy wash, it will sort itself back out to the shape because its edges are already secured. In order to get a piece off of a block like this, you need to have a tool um, some people use rulers, other people just use their fingers. This is a bone folder that I use for bookmaking. I really like it for this purpose. And you just slide it in between and peel it off and then take off the top edge. Um, I have not yet had one rip. Uh, as I've been working, the glue on these just releases really nicely. There hasn't been any edge cleanup that I've had to do. Uh, and it's just super handy because I can take this, I can throw it in my bag. I don't have to worry about pages coming loose and rocketing around, that kind of thing. Um, and I, I like that. I, I'm all about ease and convenience because I have a tendency to not just paint at my desk. Um, if I am painting at my desk, I have a tendency to work on loose paper um, just because I like being able to move my page around so that I am constantly pulling my lines towards me instead of pushing away. And that's to preserve my brushes, but also to just make everything nice and smooth. I always find that my line work is just better coming towards me. So I will frequently be rotating my paper all over the place to achieve that. It's easier for me to figure out where my lines need to go than it is for me to draw them going what to me feels like the wrong way on a page. So the biggest piece of advice I can give you when you're picking paper is pick what you can afford and try to get samples of different brands within that price range. Um, there are certain sketchbook companies that will put out like a packet of five papers that come one from each line in a particular line of books that they offer. I think Strathmore has one. Um, if you can get the samples, it's great because you can just play on them without having to commit to an entire book of the size. Uh, or the kind. Um, I've done paper swaps with people where we each go in on a book of a certain kind and we trade over pages and then that way you can kind of check it out, see what you like, see what you don't. Um, keep notes. I, I absolutely recommend if you're going to get into painting or drawing that you start a studio journal of some kind. Track what brands you're buying, track when you buy them. Uh, I started tracking how frequently I use them because I realized at a certain point that uh, if I'm not using something, it's probably because I don't like it and I didn't realize that I didn't like it. It was kind of an unconscious thing. Um, but yeah, write down your color mixing formulas. Write down that, you know, you discovered hot water works better with this particular thing than cold water. Sometimes it comes down to that, but that's also just me being finicky. Uh, studio journal, totally where it's at. Completely recommend it. Mine are messy. 
um, let me see here. I think I can show you. I don't think a studio journal was intended to be polished. It's usually kind of just a disaster waiting to happen. Um, these are not things that I typically haul out to show people because they're in various stages of completion. Um, they're just practice for me. And it lets me track ideas that I'm having, quotes that I find inspiring, that I can come back to later. But I also do stuff like swatch my paints in here. So these were the Econoline liquid watercolors that I got. I love the blue. Like you can see in here the variation that I'm getting with the same blue. I just added more water to my brush. I didn't even go back and dip it into another blue while I was doing that. And having this lets me refer back to it. I can tell with this particular blue that the more it separates, you kind of get this purple tone that's happening up in the top. That's really good to know because maybe I don't want that in a painting, but maybe I do. I don't know if that's showing up super well on camera. There we go, you can kind of see it there. Because that effect can be really, really fun to work with. But without just doing a bunch of swatching, I wouldn't have known that. Um, so yeah, like a studio journal, completely where it's at. Write down what brand you're working with. If it comes with a color, write down what color. Um, I do swatches when I'm using my Copics. Uh, to determine what I need. Frequently I will label them with my numbers. This one was just um, to figure out what blue I wanted. But where is the market stalls? So for example, I wrote down each Copic that I was working with in this area. So that if I wanted to come back and recreate pieces that would go into this set, I would know what my color scheme was that I was using. So yeah, sorry, Studio Journal, totally recommend it. After paper, what was I gonna talk about? Pencil. Sounds like a really basic thing for watercolor, right? You wanna have a pencil. Um, two things that I recommend with pencil. Don't go with a heavy pencil. I use a 2H. Um, what that gives me is a nice light line. Like I don't even know if you can see that very well on camera. That's pressing like normal. It's just letting it drag over the paper. You can go even finer with that, which I'm sure doesn't exist on camera, or you can go much heavier, which gives you a darker line. Bring this up here. So like that's the super light. That is well enough for me to see when I am painting without it being terribly obvious under paint. Uh, 2H also when you're going fairly light erases really well, which is a thing when you're working with watercolor. Um, it doesn't erase as well when you're dealing with a heavier line, but the bigger issue with a heavier line, I don't know if you can see this, is you've now actually dented your paper. You've scored lines in here, and that means that when you paint over it, the paint is going to pool in that. So you're going to have the attention drawn to that line even more strongly because there's now an indentation that's going to get reinforced with the paint. So despite the fact that you've removed most of the graphite, that will still show up on your page. The reason pencil is important with watercolor painting is once you paint over it, you will not be able to erase it. Uh, so if you're working on a coastline, for example, you want to rough it in. You want to know where your archipelago, oh, I can never say that word, archipel, no, forget it, where your islands are. Um, you want to have them outlined properly. And if you're not working with an ink line after that, you're going to want to be able to do your painting right up to that edge and then erase that edge and then bring in your next color. If you start with water or you start with whatever. Light pencil. This is my best recommendation for you. Um, to go with a light pencil, you're going to want an eraser. Um, there are a million erasers on the market now, you guys. There are so many different kinds. I am a fan of the old school white vinyl eraser. I have used them since grade school. They're cheap. I can find them anywhere. They do what I need them to do. Um, black erasers are fun, depending on what you need to do. Needable erasers, where you can like shape them like putty and change the shape of them, can be super useful. Uh, I like this one, which you can peel off the paper and it gets longer, which that's groovy. I'm a huge fan of this. I got this from Wellinked Box uh, in one of the boxes, and I love it. I think I've already used like an inch off of it. It's so handy. Uh, for people who struggle with arthritis, carpal tunnel, stuff like that, there are now mechanical erasers that like they, you put a battery in them and they kind of buzz a little bit. And so they take on the mechanical work of this gesture. 
That can be really useful if you're someone who erases a lot and struggles with your hands. Um, I have carpal tunnel in both hands. I also have arthritis. So I'm always kind of trying to pay attention to things that make my painting life easier because I'm not willing to give up the hobbies um, and my livelihood despite the fact that it, they can cause legitimate pain. Um, so ways that I get around that are finding materials that work better for me. Um, they are going to vary from person to person to person. Some people do really well with arthritis gloves. Other people do really well with like fat bodied brushes that are nice and thick in the hand. You just need to play with it um, and figure out what works for you and what doesn't. So yeah, for me, vinyl eraser. Cheap, easy, always around. On to brushes. Guys, there are so many millions of kinds of brushes. There is almost, like there are hundreds even in my local store. And when I first started painting, I was so intimidated by them. Um, I had had terrible brushes when I was a kid because that was what was available at my local hardware store. Um, Man, I think probably some of these are even them because I don't get rid of anything. Um, my brush collection has grown and they're so abused, like completely ridiculous. Some of these are in such terrible shape. Um, some of these are hog's hair uh, because that's what I could afford. I like hog's hair for doing acrylic stuff. It's really useful that way. I have a couple of sables, um, different sizes. It really depends on what you like, and in order to find out what you like, you need to try more than a few. Um, the two biggest pieces of advice I can give you with brushes is take care of them. Um, I work primarily with three brushes right now. Um, they are all synthetics. Uh, so a synthetic brush is this. It has white bristles. They are plastic of a kind. Um, I like them because they are affordable. Um, they hold their shape really, really well if you take care of them, and I can tell when they're clean. Um, if I take good care of a synthetic brush, it's always going to come back to this white color, and that will let me know if I've cleaned it well enough or not. Uh, if I haven't taken care of a brush as well as I should have, a synthetic brush is going to have dyed bristles. Uh, focus? Camera? Do it? Maybe? Um... The dye isn't really a problem as long as you know it's not going to come out in whatever wash you're doing next. But I did not take as good a care of this brush as I could. Um, one of the things about brush care that you can tell... Why will you not focus? Come on. There we go. When you get paint up in here against the ferrule, um, that will create a dead brush. And what I mean by dead brush is it's not going to spring back and give you that nice swoop feeling when you're working with it. Um, I use this one primarily for medium sized washes now because it's just not as responsive as some of my other brushes that I've taken better care of. But it really, really depends on really your diligence in taking care of your supplies. I think the brushes that I use the most probably total me $40 Canadian. The hugest part of that is this one, which was 20 bucks. I knew this was gonna be an investment. I love it. Uh, it he does beautiful, huge washes. I saved up for it. I just got it like a week ago, so I'm still like brushing it and going, oh my goodness, you're so pretty. Um, other major kind of brush that I'm super in love with are these guys. These are water brushes. You can take them, take the top off, fill this bottom chamber with water, and then you don't need to carry a water jar with you when you're traveling. So these three brushes live in my bag with this. I take them everywhere. This is what I do probably 80% of my painting with because I usually am painting in my sketchbook while I'm traveling. Um, they were synthetic. I have taken terrible care of them. Uh, so they are tinted as hell, um, but they work beautifully for what I need them to do. Um, I have filled them out of lakes up near glaciers. I have filled them with Perrier when I was desperate. Don't advise that. The carbon really messes with you getting a smooth wash. Um, but they're just super handy. I, I really cannot speak highly enough of them. I'm not crazy about the flat. I don't find that the water disperses through the head uh, as smoothly as it does with the rounds. Um, the rounds are great and I love having two sizes of the rounds just because it gives me a few more options when I'm working on things. Cannot recommend these highly enough. The third comment about brushes is don't get rid of them if you've abused them. 
Um, I have a lot of brushes that are in really, really rough shape. I keep them for doing things like liquid frisket, which I will show you guys in a minute. Um, sometimes you just need an ugly brush that you can mess up for things like dry brushing, liquid frisket, um, if you're playing with wax or something like that, don't get rid of your old brushes. Like you can even tell this one's got a bend in the metal. It's pretty terrible. I, it's still useful and you paid money for them. So you might as well use them until they're absolutely dead. Uh, palette knife, if that's a thing you're into, if you're mixing larger quantities of two colors together to try and create a custom color, it's a really great thing to have around. I don't use it as much with watercolor as I do with acrylic, still useful to have. I'm a big fan of these. This is a paint shaper instead of a brush. It's a silicone end, it's really flexible. Um, it's really fun for doing washes or creating texture lines in wet washes with. You can get them in all kinds of shapes, stuff like that giant graphite pencil. Don't advise it with watercolor unless you want that effect. Still really fun to play with. Uh, and this little rolly thing. I've had this uh, since I was 12. I think it was the best gift my mom ever gave me. You can find them all over the place. Um, they can be made of different things. This is probably going to last me until I die. It just hangs out on my shelf holding all of the brushes. I need to fix the velcro. But, you know, it hasn't been done in like six years, so apparently it's not that pressing. Alright. The next thing you would need is water. That seems really obvious. Um, I use tap water because I can. I know people who use distilled water because they say it gives them better results. I believe them that that is true for their process. It hasn't made a difference for mine, so I don't tend to worry about it. What I have noticed is I get a better result when I have a clear container. So I use a drinking glass or a mason jar or something like that because it lets me better see what is going on in here. As long as my water is clear and I can see through it, then I know that it's probably fine to be mixing colors and going in and out. And it's not going to be pigmenting if I go into this with a yellow. I'm not going to notice like an orange color immediately. Um... I do tend to clean my water after every major color if I'm working within a color family though just to kind of keep things nice and clean. As soon as I can't see through this and it becomes really really muddy that is going to start putting pigment back into the stuff that I'm working with on my paper. So as soon as you really start to notice it getting cloudy and gross go change your water. It will just give you much much better results. I used to work in um, containers that I couldn't see into because I really loved how they looked um, there's one here that's kind of sentimental for me. It's this half of a silver apple, but you can see how there's pigment, like a green pigment build up at the bottom here. That was starting to get back onto my paper. Like, even if I just dip it into what's left of the water here, like, look at how dark that is. You're going to get that back onto your page. If you put that into a yellow, it will absolutely uh, infect your color and you will not get the result that you want. Or unless you're going for a sap green, then maybe you're mixing with it and you are getting the result that you want. It's it's hard to say. It's really dependent on what your process is and what your results you're after. Clean water. It's your friend. Especially with watercolor. Um, What did I have next? Masking fluid. This stuff is fun. Oh, you guys, this stuff is so fun. So this is my new like obsession uh, with masking fluid. Uh, what it is, is it creates a layer of fine rubber over an area that you're putting it down on, and that protects it from any washes that are underneath it. So I use it in the context of masking out islands and landforms when I am working. So for example, this is a map, a commission map that I'm working on right now for Jimmy. Um, there's blue is a giant wash and the best way for me to achieve that and keep that nice and even um, in terms of it not starting and stopping all over the place like this one did was to wet the entire paper let it size and then go through with my frisket and block out all of the land mass and then once that was properly blocked out. I left the, the lakes open and stuff because I knew those needed to be there. I just wash over the entire page with nice big broad strokes and let everything dry. Once this was dry, I peeled it up. And when I peeled it up, everything was white underneath it. 
So if you're on my Instagram, there's actually a picture from a few days ago of me peeling up the liquid frisket. It comes up in a giant piece. It's kind of sticky, holds to itself really well. And it's just really satisfying. It's one of the funnest things that I do in a studio. Um, I love it a lot. So I will show you a little bit of a demonstration. I realize that we are hitting the one hour mark and typically I work for an hour, but I'm just really excited and I wanna get through the list that I prepared for you guys because it's fun. So there are two kinds of masking fluid. Uh, one is permanent and one is semi-permanent. The permanent one will block out everything and you will not be able to get it off your paper. Uh, I bought it by accident once. It's less useful to me because what I want is to be able to peel it up and get at that white afterwards because then I can introduce other colors or I can maintain that white. Uh, it's super useful for blocking out like the whites of an eye or the glint in an eye or glint on metallic substances. For me, I love it the most for coastlines. So this is two brands that I have. Uh, they don't tend to vary too much brand to brand. The biggest difference and the reason I'm showing you these is that the tints are different. I highly recommend finding a masking fluid that has a tint in it because it will help you know on a white paper what you've already laid down. And this is super important if you wanna make sure there are no gaps in your masking fluid. There are a couple of extra lakes in here compared to the intended sketch just because like this little one and those little two were errors in the masking fluid. I had just missed teeny tiny sections so when I did the blue wash they bled through down into those spots. I don't think it's a problem. I've been told I have some artistic license with the map. A few extra little lakes I don't think are going to hurt anything. But if you're doing something that really requires that white and you don't get it, you're going to lose that. And then you have to go back and try to add it in with a gouache or a white gel pen or something like that. And it isn't going to have the same luminosity because uh, it's not going to reflect light the same way as what your paper is because you're just adding a different substance. So we want to pay attention to that. So let's do a mask thing here. So I'm going to do this as a coastline. So let's just draw in a rough kind of coastline. You guys can see that, so that works. I will use the blue. One of the things that I'd recommend for Frisket is getting the smallest possible jar. Um, because this stuff is a plastic, like look, can you see those strings? As soon as it starts to dry, it will start to gum up. And you will get little crunchy things that are gumpy. That's not even a word, good job Shay. Um, and that can get into it and make it lumpy. It can get onto your paper and make things lumpy. So really you want to work quickly. Oh, don't use the good brush. After you just said, don't use the good brush. Um, you want to work quickly. You want to try to leave it uncapped for as little as possible in terms of time and shake well before using. So I have an old brush. I have a bunch of frisket loaded up here. Um, I've heard that you can store frisket upside down to help keep things from gumming up because it just moves where the air is in that pocket. I've never tried it, mostly because I'm using it all the time and I'm still trying to figure out where it lives on my desk. Uh, but yeah, I believe people who have worked with it longer than I have because more experience equals more knowledge. So I'm just doing a really quick run in here. You can kind of see from how my brush is behaving where it's already starting to set up because my brush is catching on that. <clears throat> it's important if you've got bubbles in there to try and pop them as much as possible because it will just preserve that texture in there. And so I've tried to be as faithful to this coastline as I can be, but I know for a fact I've gone over here and I've gone over here. And that means that when we pull it off later, the wash that I'm going to do along the coast will not be in those areas. So you need to be prepared to do touch-ups in that regard. And the thing about watercolor is touch-ups can be difficult to do in a way that makes them look homogenous with the part that had gone down the way you intended. I'm washing out my brush right away because that will minimize how much plastic is now stuck in my bristles. And then I will show you guys how quickly this sets up because there's already plastic set up in my bristles. So if you can see in here down here where my thumb is, that's already the plastic. And I did not have my brush out in the air for very long at all. So the best thing to do is to kind of take your fingernail, peel it down towards the tip of your brush. Don't ever go back towards the ferrule because you will just be making it 
more dense into the ends, which you don't want. <clears throat> and just do what you can to get it out. It takes a while, so I'm not going to fuss with it completely right now. I'm just going to put this brush back in the water and I'll deal with it off camera. But if you leave it in there, this entire thing will turn to rock hard plastic and you will not get it back. Which is why don't use your good brushes. You will ruin them and there is really no salvaging them because by the time you pull it all out manually by hand, you're going to have frayed the ends of this so badly you will never get a nice point again. And a nice point keeps everything really beautiful and clean when you're working with watercolors, so you want to preserve that. When you wash your brushes, get them nice and clean, shape them, either while they're wet with more water. I just stick mine in my mouth because saliva works really well. And just go pop, and then you're good. It's a terrible habit to get in. Don't do it unless your brushes are clean because certain things that are in paint will really make you sick. But it's a terrible habit I got into when I was younger and it hasn't gone away. So we just rock with it. All right, this is done. It's tacky to the touch because it is a rubber. Um, but you, it's dry, it's not coming off on my fingers when I check it. That was fast. It happens quickly. It's partly why it sets up in your brush so quickly. Um, but it's also really lovely because you don't have to wait. Um, I'm not the world's most patient person all the time, so, you know, not having to wait is great. So I'm just going to do a quick wet on wet wash here. So because I know this is masked over, I don't have to worry about the fact that I'm just going to brush over it because it's not going to take the water. So this has created the environment where the watercolor that I'm going to put on here can just move on its own accord. So see how it's doing that? So I'm just going to put this wash down. I'm coming right up to my coastline and going over a little bit because I know that that's been protected now. So we're just going to let that do its thing for a minute. Now because I'm working on the bristle, you can kind of see it with the way that the paint is moving, how it's curving down here. This isn't a watercolor paper. I should be doing it on a watercolor paper. Um, so the paper is buckling, which is pushing the paint in a particular direction. I'm going to redo this really quickly on a watercolor paper so we get a better idea of what's going on. So this is 140 pound uh, paper. It is cold pressed, so there's a bit of tooth there. <clears throat> It gives it a much more fun personality, like I was saying earlier. There we go. Pop. So I'm just being quick, but when I did the islands for Jimmy's map, for example, it took some time. Like it was, it was a very precise process because I wanted to make sure that I was being faithful to the shapes that I was given. Um, I love it because it creates a really, really realistic coastline. Just the natural variety and how your brush strokes lay down. You get a lot of fun little tiny jagged edges and indentations. And I think that that's super cool. Um, especially because coastlines are such a nuisance sometimes. I always end up making them too smooth and they just don't look realistic at the end of that process and that can be really frustrating for me. Um, but then trying to map them out in a way that is realistic um, can become overworked um, depending on how that's going down for you. So I'm just going to let that set up. I can tell from here that it's a little bit shiny still. It'll become more dull uh, when it's done so we'll just let it do that. Because it's a rubber, it's going to pull my page up while I'm working on it. If I had done this in the block that is still taped on both sides, I wouldn't be having this happen. So while that is doing its thing, oh yeah, I was going to show you watercolor boards. So I missed that. I'll take a minute to do that. One of the other grounds that you can paint on is a watercolor board. This is a piece of 140 pound watercolor paper that has been edge mounted to a piece of thick cardboard um, and what I like about these is they're super sturdy to work with um, they move around really well like I have one that I've been working on um, at craft shows with Myrna with Wellinked Box I cannot see it right now so it's probably buried somewhere and it's great. I can throw it in a small folder to protect the corners and just trust that it's going to be fine whenever I get wherever I'm going. 
And you can't say that about wandering around with loose sheets. Like if you're going to have loose sheets, then primarily that's what you're going to work on doing something like this. If you're moving around, you want to have a portfolio. Um, a portfolio can be as simple as a folded piece of cardboard. That was what got me through my year of trying to draw at Grant McEwen. I just had a giant piece of cardboard that I cut handles in. It was light. It was easy. I think it was made out of like a fridge box or something. And there were students in my course who had bought the same kind of thing from our student art supply store that just was prettier. Like it had been, you know, machine cut or whatever and had a nice white coating on the outside. I painted on mine, so I didn't care so much about that. But yeah, it can be as simple as a piece of folded cardboard. It can be as complicated as ones that are leather with vinyl insert pages to each page protect. Um, really, there's a wide spectrum and whatever your price point is at, you're going to be able to find a solution for you that's going to work that way. Uh, I'm currently storing all of my ink uh, and Copic maps in just a standard three, in three ring binder. That's an 11 by 17 orientation. I didn't know they came in that orientation until I started doing this. Very cool. And just in page protectors because that's all I need it to do. All right, we're just about there. So I'll give you a quick update on what this one is doing on the Bristol. So you can tell that we're still wet up here because that's really shiny. The cool thing about that is I can kind of reintroduce the darker color up along here and manipulate that a little bit. You'll be able to do this on other types of paper too. It's just this is a particular option. So you can see how it's kind of butting up against where this has already dried, um, which will create a pooling thing that will look really cool when everything starts to finalize and separate. It'll give the impression of depth uh, wherever the color is darkest and most dense. The brain will interpret that as being deep if it's in the color of water. Um, with land, it'll end up looking like a geographic landform, uh, and it'll look either deep or tall, depending on the context of what's going on around it. Where are we at? We are good. All right. Let's throw a wash down on here. So again, I'm going to do a wet on wet just because I like the effect of that. You can go dry on dry. I'll show you what that looks like in just a second. You can go dry on wet. It's always going to be a little bit different. Um, there's always a little bit of a degree of wet on wet with watercolor because you're working with the fluid. <clears throat> so one of my favorite things is just watching it kind of race away and do that. Now I'm being really, really generous with my color because um, I really love the vivid saturation that we get when we do that. And you can take and add more water into here and that will give you a different effect. Um, you can manipulate the edges by adding more water over here. <clears throat> Wherever you add water, it creates a pathway for the water and the color to go. Um, which will pull it in different directions and take it different places. So you can see as I'm working, the more my brush dries out, the streakier and harder these lines are getting. And compared to like how fluid things were when we were dealing with just the wet on wet over here. Uh, a lot of people want that variation when they're working. It's just surprising and fun. It's like I was saying earlier how I hate being bored by the whole painting process. Um, this is a part of things that surprises me and I like being surprised. It kind of gives me a bit more of that awe and wonder that goes along with the process. So there's a couple things you can add to a wash when you're working with it. Um, dish soap is one. It'll create a really interesting effect. I don't have any up here because I didn't think about that. Uh, rubbing alcohol will create super interesting bubbles. My favorite though is salt. This is a teeny tiny, tiny, tiny jar of table salt. Um, just take it and drop a bit. You don't need much. Uh, it will create a huge effect to it. 
what it's going to do is it's going to dissolve into the water of the paint and then it's going to start to creep out and give you almost an effect like snowflakes. You wouldn't necessarily want that in the water, although it can make some really interesting islands uh, if you do it in that way. It's more effective to do it with a larger piece of salt. Um, so if you have like a piece of pink Himalayan rock salt, for example, that's larger, that looks like, you know, a piece of my fingernail or what have you. If you set it down, it will dissolve the most strongly right under where the salt is sitting. And then it will start to radiate out in a similar kind of pattern as to what you're seeing over here that almost looks like the edges of fractals or the starts of river deltas. And it can create just a ton of fun visually to look at. Uh, I'm a particularly huge fan of using it when you're doing just like a landscape painting to represent snowflakes. I find that the effect is just really, really stunning. Um, but yeah, so we're going to let that dry up. Let's check in with the Bristol here. So you can tell that this part is so wet, but you can also see the color saturation is just really intense now where we've moved things around again. Um, I love that about this particular thing. I don't know if you can see it, but there's also a little bit of a red sheen going on on this sharp edge. And that's a quality of the ink or of the paint, sorry. Uh, sheen is something that can change from brand to brand. Uh, the formulation uh, can be really, really different. Uh, I notice it the most when I'm dealing with, for example, fountain pen inks, because you can actually get ones that have metallic sheens that are the complete opposite of the color that the ink is itself. Um, if you're interested in that kind of thing, the Goulet Pen Company has some fabulous uh, tutorials and explanations and stuff online. I'm a huge fan of what they do. They make it <clears throat> really fabulous and accessible for people. I was going to tell you guys about acrylic and India ink too, and I forgot until just now, so we'll do that in a second. Uh, so you can see, even as we're watching, that this is starting to push out into that snowflake kind of texture that I was talking about. You can see how it's going this way, that there is an arc in my paper, and that's pushing the flow of the solution, the saline solution that has happened as the salts dissolved, into that direction. You can use that to your advantage. If you really want like a streaky comet effect, you can curve your paper before you lay that down and it will naturally give you that flow. Uh, and that can be a ton of fun to work with. I really recommend if you're using anything like the dish soap, the rubbing alcohol or the salt, just play with it. Um, sit down for an afternoon or an evening or whatever and try to do as many different things with it as you can come up with. Uh, if you get lost or you get stuck, go online. People have been watercolor painting forever. There are so many fabulous tutorials out there by people who actually know what they're doing and not just me who's kind of showing you what I figured out on my own. It's, it's a really, really versatile medium. I'm not even scratching the surface on what you can do with it, really. So while that's drying up, I will show you the things that I forgot to show you. Um... <clears throat> There are two other kinds of liquid that I use on a regular basis. Neither of these are watercolor, but they behave in a way that is similar. So the first one is a liquid acrylic ink. Um, I'm particularly in love with Liquitex's inks, but there are other brands out there. Um, this one is a muted pink, which came out in a limited edition line that they did. It's still available. It's one of, I think, four colors. And just the tone of it is absolutely gorgeous. When it's liquid, a liquid acrylic behaves pretty much exactly like a watercolor. It is dilutable, it works with different kinds of media that you can drop into it, um, gives you beautiful washes, really, really gorgeous density, um, and you can like drip into it and get a similar kind of blooming effect. Where am I? I'm off camera. <clears throat> similar blooming effect to what you'd get if you were working with watercolor. And it's, I love it, it's absolutely fabulous. The advantage of dealing with acrylic ink is once it is dry, it's water fast, which means that if you go to paint on top of it, it will stay in place exactly as you laid it down. Um, watercolor does not do this. As soon as you add a wet media on top of watercolor, even if it is completely dry, you will get some kind of pigment shift on that lower layer. You'll get more of it if you're rough with your brush. 
You'll get less of it if you're super gentle just doing a glaze on top of it, but you will get movement. That can be really desirable if suddenly you want to mix a little bit on the page to like blend an edge or change the color a tiny bit, or it can be really undesirable if you're trying to preserve a purity of color. It really depends what you want, what you're trying to do with it. Again, this is where playing with your stuff to kind of learn the limits of it becomes really, really useful. I like the permanency of acrylic. Um, I find it gives me a really great like kind of base layer to work with. I love the translucency. It's just as translucent as working with a watercolor. If that's the color that you choose, you can get ones that are more opaque, of course. Uh, opaque meaning more difficult to see through. <clears throat> I'm not sure if I explained that at the beginning or not. Some people don't know. Um, really, really your call. I find they both have their place. I use them intermingled in my processes. Not a problem. The third option is a colored India ink. And this is kind of what got me into liquid media. I love the color saturation of these. I think that they're beautiful. They, again, behave exactly like a liquid watercolor when you're working with them, and they dry fast like a liquid acrylic. Um, the painting, if you're on my Facebook page, that octopus that's in my banner is painted entirely with the Liquid India inks. And the color translucency is just out of this world. They mix really, really well. Um, and yeah, they're, they're color fast once they're dry, which is a magnificent thing if you want to do stippling, which is what that octopus is, because um, that let me kind of build up the color as it went, uh, which created its own effect for shading and stuff like that. So we have dried, dried, awesome. So now that we're dry, we're going to take off this liquid frisket that we were talking about, which is another word for masking fluid. I learned the term originally from a British uh, book on painting, so I use frisket. It's more commonly known as masking fluid in Canada and the United States. So let's start on the Bristol because that was where we started from first. So now we have two colors going on here. I don't know if you can see the edge of the frisket or not. Um, there will be two places where it's been masked out. We have the blue along the coast and then we have the green up here. So what I'm using here, this is just a rubber cement pickup. You do not need to use this. You can scrub it up with your finger and it will peel, no problem. Um, just like that. I prefer using a rubber cement pickup simply because I do have problems with my hands and I find that it just makes things faster and a little bit easier because I'm grabbing at a bigger surface. And for me, that's relevant. Not relevant for everybody. Um, a rubber cement pickup is not expensive. I think this one was like five bucks. It's never going to die, so I will have it for the rest of my life. And I'm good with that. It just makes the job a little bit faster and easier on my hands. And then yeah, when you're done, just clean it off, you're good to go. It is like kind of grabby, so I still store it in the paper that it came in and then the plastic mostly because it tends to hang up on stuff like the soles of brand new sneakers and I just find that irritating. So yeah, make sure you put your goo away once you peel it up. Um, it will stick to stuff until it collects enough lint to no longer stick to stuff. That can be annoying. So let's have a look. So you can see where the frisket bled over the coastline because I wasn't being precise in my application and you can use that to your advantage. You can either extend your coastline to like it or you can change the watercolor to make it look way more shallow. Um, this is typically why I advise working in pencil because then it's less obvious if you have an error there than when you're working with pen. And then with this one it's the same kind of thing. And you can see how where it's butted up against the liquid frisket as opposed to the heavy black pen line that I put down, it looks like a more natural coastline. Like there's little divots and jetties and that kind of thing and you can work with that. Um, what I like to do is just go with pencil, make my coastline and then go back in with ink and <clears throat> ink it afterwards. Like what's been going on on this map. And it just gives you another layer of realism. So when you're done with the salt and everything is dry, just brush it off. 
and it gives you this really interesting snowflake texture. So depending on the saturation of salt, you will eventually end up with a pure white dot underneath it. Like it will push out all of the pigment. And that's when I start probably turning things into islands. So we can take this and using a black pen. Oh, I was gonna talk about pens too. Let's do that really quick. The best thing about working in watercolor is its mutability. You can change it up as much as you want to. However, sometimes you're gonna want a line that's not gonna move under that much water. In order to achieve that, you need to find a brush that is water fast, which means it has a pigment in it that is not going to return to liquid once you put the water over it. I have a couple favorites. So this is a Tombow, come on, focus, camera. You can do it. Um, Fudenosuke, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. I have zero Japanese experience in my life. It is a brush style pen for calligraphy. I love the variation in line that it gives. I use it for drawing a lot of my maps. This one is a Copic multi-liner. It is waterproof and Copic proof and it just tells you that right on the barrel, which is great. Uh, the reason I love this is you can get them in a lot of widths. It's a metal body, so it's going to last forever. You can also replace the nibs and the ink cartridges. So while it's more expensive to start with, um, the fact that I can do my own upkeep on these pens means that I can change out the nibs if it's starting to bother me. I can refill it. Ultimately, that's going to be less environmental waste, which is really important to me. And it just gives me more control over what I'm doing. Copic makes good stuff. I like it. Uh, the next is a Pigma Micron. These are also a pigment ink uh, for waterproof, and they say on here like waterproof and fade proof lines. Archival is a big deal because it means there's no acid in it. Um, acids will yellow over time. Uh, I should have said this in the paper area too. You want an acid free paper uh, whenever you can, simply because it will not yellow over time. So your work is going to stay more true to how you produced it originally if it exists 20 or 30 years from now. I don't think I have a single piece of mine that has lasted that long, so it has yet to become relevant. And then this is another one of the Tombos. This is their drawing pen, and it's just a different nib uh, than the brush pen. I really like them. They lay down nicely. Not refillable the way the Copics are. Neither they or the Microns are, but I love the nib shape enough that I'm willing to kind of split my time a little bit. But if you're going to use something like, this is a Muji, just a click pen, um, it will give you a different kind of line that will bleed. And sometimes you want that, like you can create some really cool effects by laying down that line and then taking your wash into it. Oh, that's not the good brush. Let's use the good brush. Um, and just using that to your advantage to create that bleed, right? Maybe you want that to create a shadow over the edge. Um, it can be really fun for mucking around with um, dungeon maps because you can kind of do that to blend it out and then do like dice and hatching or something like that. Just make sure before you get really deep into a map that you're super excited about that you test your pens with water because there's nothing worse than getting really really deep into something being super proud of how it's going and then throwing down your first wash and having everything go whoosh. Been there, done that, very much not fun. Okay. Talked about inks, talked about that, talked about rubber pickup. Wax crayons can be a lot of fun with this as well because it creates what is, it's another mask, um, which makes the watercolor run off of where it is. The challenge with wax is getting it off again. Um, if you want to remove the wax afterwards, it usually involves laying a piece of fabric over your piece or a piece of newsprint will work if you're not too worried about the ink transfer and then ironing it to suck up the wax. Most people, if they do a wax resist with a crayon, they just leave it down. Um, they're not intending to pick it back up again. I get how that works. It's not my favorite texture if I'm going back over to work over it again. And also you can't lay anything else down on top of it either. Most pens won't stick to it. It'll gum up your Sharpies, stuff like that. When you're working in watercolor, you can mix your own colors or you can buy as many pre-mixed colors as you want. Um, I have a tendency to mix my own um, just because I like the variation that happens with that. 
So you start out with whatever set of pre-mades that you want. Uh, I recommend if you're going to buy a set of pans or a set of tubes that you start out with at least your primary colors. Primary colors are red, yellow, and blue for painting. They're different for theater. I'm not totally sure how that works. I've never gotten the theory through it. Um, it's subtractive rather than additive, I think. Anyway, that's what Google's for. Sorry, off topic. Um, when you're picking your primaries, you want something that is a true red, a true yellow, a true blue. There are going to be different recommendations from different people about what that means as you're going. Um, but basically, as long as you have the red, the yellow, and the blue that you like how they combine, theoretically, you can mix every other color from them. Um, so, like, I have some greens here. I use those greens pretty regularly, but you can also mix them. So, grabbing this yellow, I have some blue on top of it because I was mixing greens already. Just getting it nice and wet, picking up a lot of paint. And lay it down over here. Put some more water into it so it's nice and fluid. And then we'll take some blue. I like how this one's looking lately. And you can tell that I didn't wash out my brush really well because it's got kind of that bright hot teal on top of it right now. And that's cool. Use that. Mix them together. And that's given me that particular shade of green. If you vary the color of the yellow or the blue, if you vary the amount of the yellow or the blue, you will get a whole bunch of different shades. Um, I like that because it just adds a layer of customization in a map that it's the same thing as choosing colors out of a selector on Photoshop. Um, it just makes it yours in a way that's not showing up anywhere else. So I'm just going wet onto dry here. You'll notice how I've got a harsher line as I'm working, as that was, it's not bleeding all over the place the way that it was working wet into wet. This gives you more control. Uh, if you want to build up a canyon range or a mountain or something like that, this is going to give you the highest level of precision. Um, proof in point. See how I got a little bit bleed over here and now the blue is creeping up on my green? This is what I mean about as soon as you put down a, another wet material on top of a dry watercolor, you're going to get that movement. So this is me not being precise, but it's a really good example of what I was talking about. Um, when you have errors like that, there's some things you can do that might work it out, kind of make it better. Um, one, you can adjust your coastline, kind of sneak it up so that it covers the flaw. Uh, I've turned other errors into bays. Um, so for example, on this map, I had a huge bleed come through. I just adjusted it. It doesn't look realistic, but it looks a lot more sensical than just this giant blue splotch that didn't have an explanation on the corner of that map. And because this was just for my own playing around, it was less important that I have something that was showable to other people. Um, so you can take colors and you can like draw your mountain ranges, for example, and just decide what shape they're going to be. You can let that dry. You can dilute it and put washes in there to kind of create your shadows a little bit. And I typically favor a really intense um, ink look with my stuff. Like for me, watercolor is an accent. The work that I tend to do a lot of is black and white um, with a really heavy set of line. But you can create that after you've done your painting too. So once this dries up, I'll show you what I mean. And there are a million things that I could say about how to create a map and like isometric versus top down, all of that jazz. Uh, that's not going to be for this video. I'm still learning that and I don't really feel confident telling other people how they should be doing it. But I can talk about just putting paint down because that's something that I do. So we're going to let that dry up and maybe let's use a little bit of the liquid so you can have a look at that. 
So part of the reason why I never clean these aspects on my palette is because I can pick up those colors and add them into other things very easily, um, creating a custom shade. I don't think they're ever a waste. Um, I quite like that aspect of it. Not everyone does. Uh, I know people who keep much, much cleaner palettes than I do, and I admire them. That's an aspect of things that I have less patience for. Um, I'm kind of wabi-sabi about the whole thing. So what I'm doing now is just kind of playing with my coastline a little bit. And the great thing about watercolor is you can kind of work back and forth until you get what you want. <clears throat> the biggest thing is just to keep blending it. Like if you want it to be smooth, add water back and forth until you get the results that you want. If you don't want it to be smooth, don't worry about that. Um, this is where just playing with your stuff comes in knowing what it's going to do for you and what it's not. I think one of the other things that's important is knowing where it's going to pool and knowing what you want to do with that pool if you have too much pigment on your brush. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that you can do with watercolor that's really amazing is you can pull pigment out again. Um, you can just get your brush wet once it's dry and just lift up that particular section. Um, that's super handy. Um, I've found that I, I love it because you can create that white space again and get that translucency back. Um, I do prefer doing it um, when I'm doing with Copics because the Copic system for that is just brilliant using the colorless blender. Um, but with watercolor, you can do it as well. So if this gets too overworked, you can just start pulling it back up again. It's not going to be super precise, and the more you do it, the more you're going to saturate the tooth of your paper, which may change the texture. But it will be an option at the very least, and that's pretty cool. So we're going to let that dry for a second. <clears throat> Part of what's going on with the mountains is that I did the mountain range itself in this rose acrylic ink. So when I started er erase, not erasing, layering with the watercolor over it, it pulled some of the pigment out, which I quite like the effect of now. Um, but I wasn't planning that when I first did it because I'd actually forgotten that I'd laid this down as acrylic. So we'll let that dry up for a second. When you're working, it's really important to work light to dark because you can always add color, but you will not have as easy of a time taking color out. Um, while you can do a fair amount with watercolor to remove the color after, you're never going to get back to that pure white paper. There will always be something there. So it's a much better idea to have a solid plan for what you're going for. And this is where spending money and time drafting things out on student grade draft paper or full scap or newsprint or whatever until you have a solid plan is a really good idea because then you're going to have fewer errors when you're laying it down. Um, I'm going just ad hoc with all of this because I spent all my planning time making lists of things I wanted to tell people and finding those supplies instead of like, hey, this is the actual math I wanted to do. Part of it is because I prefer videos where you see everything come into life while the person is working even if it's not beautiful just because it's more illustrative of the process and I think the process is important and demystifying the process is important um, although I have a lot of respect for people that make beautiful tutorial videos <laughs> one day I'm still pretty new to this maybe I'll be good at it one day so it's now fairly dry to the touch I can still tell that the paper is a bit damp and I'm gonna give it another second or two just because if I'm going back in there with a pen um, I don't want to ruin my pen nib and I don't want to break up the surface of my paper. Part of the way I can tell that it's not dry yet is I can see that the paper is buckling along this axis. <clears throat> if it's completely dry, it should go pretty much 100% flat again. 
So when I'm dealing with color and ink, there's two ways of doing it. You can color it in first and add your ink after, which is what this is going to be, or you can ink first and then color after, which I will show you an example of right now. Oh, this is drying. So <clears throat> say we're working on mountains. I have an idea for my mountain range. It's going to go over here. This one is going to go this way. And I'm going to have it come forward. It's a terrible design because it's leaning, but we'll go with that. And then this one is going to branch down here. Branch down here. These ones are in the background. It's going to go this way. So one of the things for me about doing mountains is just creating the kind of shapes and then giving a sense of what direction they're moving in. There are many other and better mountain tutorials out there by far. Um, feel free to experiment until you find the mountains that you like. I'm just monkeying around to show you guys this painting technique. So, As I was saying before, I favor um, pen and ink drawing. And I favor a fairly heavy hand with my ink. Um, I think this is because I grew up drawing primarily in ballpoint pen and Sharpie because they were what's available. Um, and one of the biggest benefits to both of those is that line weight is something you have to get really, really creative with um, if it's something you're using to use a lot of. And usually line weight for those ends up being thicker instead of darker. So... I grew up with a very comic book style of drawing with materials that favored a particular kind of movement. Um, and I still hang on to that in a lot of ways. So when I'm doing mountains, I favor a really thick ridge line and then a fairly distinct shadow line. Um, part of the holdover of my Sharpies is that if I make a mistake, I'm more likely to just go in and blend the mistake into the intended line until I end up with a smooth line again. Um, cause you can't really walk it back, uh, when you're using a Sharpie. Whiteout will never give you the smooth finish that you want <laughs> to play with when you're using ink, or at least that's been my experience. If you've got ways of making it happen, I want to know about them. So that gives me my basics. Uh, the mountains that I've been super obsessed with lately, I've been going into these sections and adding hatch lines that are going in different directions. And that creates the shadow while giving us some visual variety, a sense of movement even in these objects that are very stationary. For me it came out of doing a lot of study lately on um, Art Nouveau styling with how that happens and particularly like the stained glass stuff that's associated with uh, Lewis Comfort Tiffany. Uh, I'm really in love with stained glass lately and kind of how things get sectioned off into thing areas and manipulated kind of one by one like that. I don't really have a plan when I'm doing this. I kind of just pick a direction and go with it. Sometimes it's more successful than others. There's times when I look back on a mountain range and go, oh yeah, no, that didn't work out so well. I think a lot of that is just confidence though, being like, yeah, well, I intended to do it even when you didn't. People will tend to believe you. And if it's really terrible, it's just terrible. And that's fine. Make art, make bad art. When it sucks, start again. The only way you get better is to keep going.
All right, so we have some mountains. <clears throat> I'm going to play with some fun colors because we haven't done a lot of that yet. Like I said, sometimes landscapes are boring. So let's do some purple mountains maybe. Hey, purple could be fun. So we'll take some of this blue we had before. We'll take some magenta. And the more you play with mixing, the more you'll know. Oh, I like how this goes together. Oh, I like how that goes together. Um, there's some fabulous color theory books out there. There's one called The Color Bible that handles color theory for watercolor, acrylic, oil, gouache, and pencil crayon. Um, I bought it quite a while ago, but as far as I know, it's still being printed. And it taught me so much, um, particularly about stuff that I hadn't had access to at that point. Like, I'd never worked with gouache. Uh, so being able to see someone else's attempts with it really told me a lot about the material before I had a chance to work with it. So what I'm doing is just adding a little bit of color here, a little bit of color there. I'm picking up some of the color that's already existent on my palette to kind of change things up a little bit. Keep it a little more unique. One of the things when you're doing mountains is you need to know what direction your light is coming from. So I kind of already implied that by putting all of the shadows on one side of the mountain. Um, that is one of the single biggest things that I see people who don't have a lot of drawing experience doing on a mountain or even on a map in general that kind of makes it look a bit more chaotic. If you can keep your light source really consistent, it will give you way more unification in how your final product looks. And that will just create a more immersive experience, which will make your map more believable. Um, so when you're dealing with light sources, decide. My light is coming from here. I have, honest to goodness, put a post-it note above the drawing that I'm working on that has said, your light source is here. Or I'll make a pencil mark or something like that. Because then I can take a ruler or my brush and I can radiate out from that point. And that helps keep everything nice and smooth and consistent. So I'm just adding some more magenta here to change things up a little bit. Adding some more water. So the more water I add, the more translucent things are. Less water, more dense. More dense, the less likely you are to see these black lines underneath which can be great if that's a thing that you don't want to deal with. It can be really annoying if you were hoping to preserve those lines. I'll go up here and grab a little bit of a different red. Work that in. Here to that original blue. So one of the mistakes that I can see here is that this section right here is just so much lighter than this one and that shouldn't be the case because this section here is part of that mountain so I just need to go in with a bit of a darker color and tamp that down a little bit. So I've left this all white on this facing for now, but what you can do to keep it kind of unified is just grab a lot more water, give yourself a really nice light wash, like even that's too dark. Come back in. That's better. Maybe let's do that one more time. There we go. And that changes up your translucency. And then just go in and give yourself a little bit of a colored highlight in the areas that you think there'd be still a little bit of shadow on the face of your mountain. Talking about white and black for a second. In nature, white and black are very, very rare. Um, most of the time what you have are shades that are approaching white 
like an eggshell, which is not a true Xerox paper white. It's more of an ecru or a cream. Um, you want to learn about shades of white, go look at the color descriptions of wedding dresses. Seriously, <laughs> it will blow your mind. Um, true blacks are also very, very rare. They tend to be darker charcoal grays or a Payne's gray or a lamp black, that kind of thing. So me using a like black ink on a map is going to be very stark. We're used to it because we use black ink in other forms of drawing, marketing, comic books, graphic novels, um, old school etched engraving plate illustrations by the kind, like the kind that, uh, for example, Albrecht Dürer was doing with the invention of the printing press. That is very much a man-made thing. It's not necessarily a natural thing. So use it judiciously. Use it intentionally. Know what you want it to do for you um, in order to make it the most useful. Like you can tell that there's a really jarring break where I stopped using the black here. Um, so once this is dry, I'm gonna go back in and I'm gonna add a horizon line because I need that because right now it's floating and it looks really, really silly. White is also equally rare. We see it in certain minerals like zinc. We see it close in certain kinds of ash. Snow is probably the best example. But all of those things are also not pure white. White is the thing that your eye gets drawn to the fastest on a page. It is just somehow how we're wired as humans. So when you use it, know that. Um, the first thing we notice about this map is it's colorful. The second thing we notice is the ripples on the edge of these waves. And that was intentional. And it also turned out that I had them going the wrong direction. <laughs> and because they were very bright and obvious, people noticed that. Um, so know that. Use it to your advantage. With watercolor, we're doing it in a way that the white is coming through to give you that translucency. But if you're going to apply it after the fact or you're going to mask it out to keep it that way, know that. Make it punchy. Uh, now that this is dry, like we can see how quickly our eyes go to these light spots in the water. The contrast is really impressive and it's something that our brain is inherently interested in. So know that. Use it. Um, let's let this dry for a minute because it's not quite done. We'll go back into this one while that's doing its thing. My favorite form of white to add into things if I can't preserve it from the beginning is a gel pen. Um, you can get just beautiful, clean marks with a gel pen. Gel pens are tricky, <laughs> I find. Um, I find they tend to gum up. It can be challenging to get one that works for you. I've never succeeded in having one last the entire way down a barrel. I always seem to jam the ball somehow. It's a nuisance. Um, there are products out there that seek to remedy that for you. Copic makes a really amazing dip well of white ink um, that you can use a dip well with. I am saving my pennies for that. I really, really want it. Um, this is a Uniball Signio. Uh, it's my current favorite white ink one. But the Jelly Ball, uh, this is the wrong one, but Jelly Roll, they have... A white that's really good too and I like how fine the tip is it's identical to this it's just in a white which I don't have on my desk right now um, gouache you can use uh, which has the benefit of being you can thin it out to whatever translucency you want pretty much and you can um, use a brush of any fineness with it white color what well, words watercolor does come with titanium white that you can get which functions almost like a gouache it's fairly opaque uh, you can add it to things. You can add it to things to make pastels, although it will, again, change the opacity. I would rather make pastels by mixing it and then diluting it till you get a translucence just to preserve the texture of the paper and that luminosity. But yeah, white. It, your brain goes right there. So, let's do some black in here. Where's the brush I want? So we already have these ranges worked in like this. Um, what I tend to do with that is then go in and put my ridge line in, in a more firm way. The great thing about this is you have the natural variation of the watercolor kind of guiding your ridge line the same way that you would with the coast, right? It gives you just a bit more of a natural look. And then I figure out where my drag lines are that give me the sense of scale and shape for these mountains. 
And I kind of worked that out earlier with the acrylic as well, just the way that that is sloping. And then I kind of find a few more of the found lines where things are going on. And then I add my hatching. I'm not as much of a fan of this because I have a harder time figuring out my geography when I'm doing it this way. Like it'll still look fine, it just won't do what I want it to do. Um, so yeah, it's been really, really interesting for me to kind of figure out what my preference is as I go along. Um, I think because of the way I've come up drawing for myself that this is it for me. Like I, I really love it. It's really bold, it's really graphic, and I'm just a fan of how it, it shakes down. So we're dry enough now. I can go in and just add a bit of a horizon line here. And just what I'm doing with this is just creating a sense of where things are. Um, one of the other mistakes that I see people make when they're doing horizon work is that it's always a straight line across. That's not necessarily true in terms of how we register landforms. It's true in like the curvature of the world sense. Um, but this mountain does not just stop right here simply because this is what the demarcation would be for a horizon on the page. The geography pulls forward into the foreground. Um, so we would need to represent that somehow in order to make that obvious to the viewer. Oh, man. Guys, I think we made it to the end. I'm just looking at my list here. I think that was everything I wanted to cover. Wow, okay, so this is almost two hours long. I... I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. I think that this was productive. So I am going to sign off and get to work on Jimmy's map again. And I will post this to my mapping group on Facebook. And hopefully that's useful for people. And if you are looking for a mapping group to join on Facebook, Fantasy Maps and Worlds is where we're hanging out. Um, really good group, tons of different levels of experience and so helpful. We're learning from each other all the time. So feel free to come hit us up there if you're so inclined. If you're looking for me, I am Monocled Octopus on Instagram and on Facebook. I have a Twitter, not terribly good at Twitter, sorry. Um, trying, but I don't know, it's not really my jam. Uh, there's also a Patreon if that is your thing under Monocled Octopus as well. Otherwise, I'm just a human doing human things. I up videos hopefully once a week just as part of my own personal practice and I like helping people so if you have a question throw it in the bottom and I will do my best to give you an answer. In the meantime you guys take care and thanks for hanging out with me. Catch you later.